Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives. With lots of authenticity and a touch of humor, here is your host, Steve Bisson. Je vous remercie, Mr. Announcer, and welcome to episode 122. Uh, if you haven't listened to episode 121 yet, Jenny Helms Calvin was on. She was amazing. I follow her on social media. Got to meet her. She's an amazing interview. She's starting a group coaching, and I hope you go and listen to that episode. You'll hear more about it. But episode 122 is a follow-up of episode 108 with the Mental Men. This is a great group of guys that I've known for years. Dennis Sweeney, who I considered a mentor for many years, he now calls me a colleague, which is always weird. Pat Rice, who has been on nine episodes, and hopefully he will be back again. Andrew Kang, who is now on number two for himself, as well as Dr. Robert Cherney. This is a great group of guys. We talk about different things, and I never know where we're going to go with these interviews. So how about you listen and you tell me what you think? Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 122 of... Uh, finding your way through therapy. I'm bringing back the mental men. We were on episode 108 and we didn't even get through half the questions. And now we, as usual, chatted, we've played golf and the whole nine yards. So now we have about 27 other topics. So this is great for a podcast, but also time management wise, not so good. Uh, But I want to welcome back uh, my guests, Andrew Kang, Robert Cherney, Pat Rice, and Dennis Sweeney. Welcome guys. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Yeah. you know, just as a quick, I know we quick is not something that we do really well here, but quickly, if you can reintroduce yourself, if you got, if everyone wants to have a better intro, go to episode 108, but just a quick intro and we'll start off with Dennis. Uh, well, Dennis Sweeney and uh, been a, uh, a therapist for a very long time now. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh my specialty is around addiction and recovery, but I have a, a pretty much a general uh, mental health practice. Well, welcome again, Dennis. And uh, I feel like there's going to be a part three just based on our 50 minute conversation prior to this. Uh, Pat Rice, you're next. Um, I'm the elder statesman here, although um, not the longest practicing one because it was a midlife. Uh, Mid thirties crisis that ended me in Dennis's office as my my intern supervisor, but I developed the practice uh, mostly around trauma and dual diagnosis, and have shifted more recently into wellness, aging, spirituality, grief, loss, and uh, some of that esoterica, and uh, and that's about it. Robert Cherney or Doctor Robert Cherney? <laughs> I always forget the doctor part. Hello. Uh, my name is Bob Journey, and uh, I, uh, at this point in my career, and as Dennis put it, it's been a few decades now that uh, I've been practicing. I have the, I have the uh, privilege, I think, of, of doing a couple of things. One is I'm the chief psychologist at a large mental health agency. It's a community mental health agency, which gives me a lot of exposure to many, many different kinds of things, uh, and, you know, not just social class path you know psychopathologies things like that but it gives me a lot of uh, opportunity to teach which i really enjoy um and i also have a private practice um so uh, my i'm a psychologist as well as a licensed alcohol and drug counselor so i see a fair amount of dual diagnosis as but i i tend to keep my practice limited to adults because children tend to break my heart and uh mm. i uh it's it's difficult and forgot to say EMDR practitioner, but I'll I'll plug that for you. I'm a what kind of practitioner? EMDR. Oh yeah, yeah, I do that too. So <laughs> nothing like age to forget what you've done. There you go, <laughs> uh, Andrew. Hey, uh, Steve. Thanks for having us again. Um, my name is Andy Kang. I'm a private practice therapist. This is my second career. Also, was a lawyer in my past life. Do not regret that decision. So happy to be here. <laughs> I, I, I do also work with people with substance abuse issues. Um, did my training at Advocates with Bob and Dennis. 
really taught me a lot. And that's why I'm here with you guys is to learn more. Well, I think it's kind of what we were talking about prior. One of the oh. things I realized talking to all of you is that I'm the youngest in this group, which makes me feel young. And also, oh, my God, what is our like the people behind us, so to speak, coming up? And, you know, part of the stuff we talked about in the episode 108 is the mentorship stuff. I know that me and Andrew take that very seriously. I know that you guys had Dick, who really was supportive of you and kind of like mentorship. And we were talking a little bit about how, you know, what's, you know, we used to think that there were too many therapists coming in, as uh, Pat, uh, Robert said earlier, or Bob. Um, i got to stop reading the names on the Zoom thing. <laughs> But um, at the end of the day, we, we always think that, and yet there's always some, you know, young, up-and-coming new people coming in. But we definitely see a shift from one generation to another. I don't know what you guys want to talk about in regards to that, but I think it's important to think about what's next in general mentorship-wise. That's a very good topic because I've said to almost anyone that would listen, I think I retired out of the hospital system. Um, where I had an intern program for the same hospital I, I, I met Bob and, and Dennis in and, and worked under them uh, as a student. And then I was the guy in charge of the intern system for about 20 years. But I, that was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. But I said to almost anybody, I really miss the students because, as Andy said, that's how I learned. I know Andy still teaches at, at BC, in the social work school, and I used to guest lecture for him. I loved it, um, and it's because it's the best questions. And so one of the things that, that these types of connections and the connection that I have with all of you guys often on, on a golf course these days as well is that it's uh, it keeps it fresh because I never am without a panel of uh, to, uh, to throw something by, which is how the mental men started and then expanded into a big peer supervision network, is that you have to have somebody to share things with, whether it is your personal uh, challenges as, as they affect your practice or that uh, uh, when we were meeting live, I remember some of those clinical case presentations were that there was genius around listening to the formulations and the other peer eyes uh, focus. So I really miss it. And um, I noticed that one of the things that is we shifted away from our old core in the peer supervision that we're, I've always encouraged students to, 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 meet, to find that, which is what the intern seminar was about to begin that process of always having a community, um, is that there were some of the real newbies that started with us years ago uh, faded fast. They faded out quickly as opposed to, and so it was kind of the core of the old guard. Uh, it's changed now, thank goodness. Um, but uh, I, I really miss the teaching aspect of it and uh, value so much these connections because it helps to keep it fresh. We used to really maybe get more of that in the office. Yeah. You know, having been Live. back to the office this year really uh, has been useful for that. But when we weren't in the office, it was tremendously isolating. Mm. Um, so it was even more important to see people and to talk about what's going on. But I have ongoing supervision that I pay for so that I, you know, in addition, just to have a specific outlet to discuss cases and to run issues by. Um, but the peer supervision is really important too. So um, I think we can't, we can't ever get enough, but in terms of helping the younger folks, I just try to be available. You know, I just try to take all questions at equal value and weight and try to give the best advice I can to people. It's, it's funny because as therapists, we, really withholding advice a lot of the time we're you know holding back our reins but in supervision it's it's almost the opposite it's sort of you get to say what you think a lot more which i i kind of like mm -hmm. I, I think i'll jump on that because i i've had interns now for at least 15 years or maybe 20 years and i really have come to the conclusion that it's rejuvenating 
you know, there's an energy that flows back and forth between whatever I am, the teacher, I suppose I'd call it to, um, to the students and, and the, the younger folks who are basically coming into the field, which I find really encouraging on the one hand, because there's so much enthusiasm and so much intelligence and it's a, it's a wonderful way to do it. Um, but one of the things I do, you know, I, I, I've really come to understand is that as I teach, I learn. And the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. And so it's a good thing that uh, I keep teaching uh, on the one hand. But I also, this translates into something I always say, there are no stupid questions. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of, if I'm doing a group, especially now that we're, we do things on Zoom a fair amount, you know, there might be 30 people in the room, so to speak. And, pe- you know, I'll notice certain people will just kind of like not talk. And I know they have something to say because I've talked to them in person. And so when I do this, I I often will just watch the screen and look for facial changes and things. And when people, you know, scrunch up their mouth or they they tilt their head and then I'll call on them. And of of course, they, they, they come forth with something that's really an interesting point. And I'm always struck with how much knowledge and wisdom is in the room, no matter how old people are. And and I really, that's what I love, because you come out of it feeling, uh, again, like, wow, we've got a great team here. They have a lot to offer, and I'm glad I'm part of it. Bob, I was, uh, I was bummed that my son, Joey, decided not to go train with you guys, because I wanted him to be kind of at your knee for a while and to get mm-hmm. his clinical training. Uh, he ended up going to a school where he's going to actually be able to do working with teams, so that, which is really more what he wants to do. But I just I knew that was good, that would be good for him, and that he would get a lot of great mentorship and um, information just doing those clinical hours. But uh, <laughs> he made the choice. <laughs> well, he's always welcome back, Andy. <laughs> so, yeah, hey, yeah, there'll be more all- opportunities, I'm sure. All he's got to do is, is give me a call and uh, he's got a job if he wants it. So <laughs> uh, I'm a, I, I really hope he has a great experience. It's, you know, you got to make a choice about that kind of stuff. And he's, you know, he's wise. I think there's, you know, that's where he's going to have stuff that he really is interested and passionate about. The community mental health system gives you a lot, a very broad range of experience, which is wonderful. But it also, the way I say it is sometimes we have to throw people into the deep end of the pool even though they're not as experienced as I'd like them to be. So there's, you know, there's trade-offs, but you learn. Well, I think that being thrown into the deep end of the pool is exactly what the community mental health system is. And in a good way, because this is where you learn what you don't like and what you like and what others can bring to you. One of the things that I still remember to this day and is sitting in that room with you in Marlboro, and having a bunch of people throw ideas out. I think even of our supervision, when we used to have it uh, more formally as a peer support system, it was always interesting to have, a, like, you know, Pat would bring, you know, and again, I'm going to give examples that are true. I think that Pat has a lot more of a spiritual sense to what is going on, which is very important in therapy. And I, I'll stand behind that until someone proves me wrong. Then this is much more grounded and is also able to look at things from that perspective. I'm more of a, you know, instinctual kind of like, uh, I, don't know, I, I just say, I blurt it out. It's called straight to the point therapy for a reason. Uh, but that sometimes <laughs> can be bad and learning to be grounded is something Dennis has really taught me. And, you know, I, at the end of the day, I think that when you talk about peer support, and I think Andy was mentioning that is that when we have other peers, there's so much in, like, there's so much in the room that we get to a different point of view. And I don't know, Dennis, what you think, but I think that that's what I feel like the peer support can be beneficial to us. I think the peer support is, is extremely beneficial in part because it, it, it gives uh, people in the group, but also the um, individuals an opportunity to sort of bounce things off. And the important part of that bouncing off is being able to take what comes back um, and mm-hmm. and being able to learn from that. Um, and when uh, one of the things that I've tried to impart over the years to interns or or people who are new in the field, but I guess uh, for all of us as as we're evolving in the field, is that um, uh, to go along with what you said, Bob, the importance of learning um, and that uh, 
um, one of the things that I was taught very early on is that the most important thing that you should take as um, sort of um, uh, reward for what you do is what you learn, both about yourself and about um, your craft, you know, what you're doing, what you know, how you can help people. Because that's the the most uh, significant way that you're going to help people is by continuing to learn. Mm -hmm. Just just as a comment to piggyback on that, Dennis, because I think it's a great point. We actually have now within the the clinics, you know, we have four clinics with about a hundred clinicians. We have peer support groups. So no longer we have the supervision groups, cons consultation groups with a more senior person running them, and then we've got they've started peer support. And I think it's wonderful because one of the things that I try to impart is to people when we're talking in, in supervision or just in the hallway, frankly, or in the kitchen, um, be open and honest and you'll learn, you know, because a lot of people think, oh my God, I'm supposed to know everything or I shouldn't feel this way or I have no idea what to say. Well, I don't know one therapist in the world that hasn't had those feelings at times. And so a lot of people, when they have peer, when they have a peer supervision group, they can really, I think, open up and be more vulnerable, which I think is extremely important. And like you said, you know, be, you can, you can give it out, but be ready to, you know, absorb it back in and take it in when, when somebody gives you feedback and it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to, to learn. So. I'll add that um, when I started with you guys, you know, in my, I was 40 years old, I think, when I was licensed, and but I started out in my late 30s as a student. Um, it was an extraordinary system we had. There were study groups and book book groups, and, you know, it was a remarkable, which I then I carried forward. It's the only way I knew how these things could run. I encouraged every group of students, and I have four or five each year, um, to, to network with each other, and they've stayed in touch. And this is a plug for you, Steve. Uh, I don't know, this may be my seventh or something, something like that, seven or eight of these podcasts, and I send them to all my students, and they love them. And, they, and, th and I hear back, and I'm, I'm mentoring more now, and Zoom is a wonderful thing because they're all over the country, literally. And um, it's, it's, they've stayed in touch with their groups, which I encourage them to do. You know, they're friends, they go to each other's weddings and, and, and things like that. And um, that community, um, I can remember just recently actually um, thinking about, you know, um, how smart everyone is. And the young people have a fresh pair of eyes. The younger clinicians have a fresh pair of eyes. And, Many a time in Dennis's office when we were doing the supervision live, someone, Mark, or someone else would, would jump in uh, with a formulation. And I go, I never even considered that. You know, and, and then I thought to myself, I'm really surrounded by some really smart people. And as you guys know me well, I'm not afraid to ask a question. You know, I, I'm kind of, uh, I, I'm really open to that um, because I've said that so many times. And I love the dialogue. And um, my old mentor, all of us who knew, um, uh, Dick, Dick Fleck, who was a wonderful, who was a chaplain and a wonderful man who was on the team. So we, we started with as a psychologist, actually. Um, but he used to, he used to always be, be referring to the fact that, um, you know, we, we have to stay grounded in our own humility. And that we, we don't know as much as, as no one can be on top of everything. We, we, we learn in a community. And um, he was also the one that I think instituted the secondary in initial diagnosis. Everybody that came in had some access one diagnosis and then it was unresolved grief, mm. you know? And um, I, I've learned that, that that's, the, that's one of the vulnerabilities is that um, we have, to, I always have to, for me, I'll speak, I have to manage my grief. Whatever it is, I agree. That's why I don't treat young people with opiate addictions anymore. I, I, I probably two hundred of them I lost, and the last one broke my heart, as it broke almost every heart in Natick, as I recall. But you know, it's just uh, you have to know your limits and and being humble, and being able to share that my limits with 
with uh, compassionate and smart guys like you and, and gals and women that we've we've have in our our world as well in our peer supervision network. It's it's been invaluable. But the, the students love these podcasts. They do, and they look forward to them. So I never said that to you, I don't think, Steve. And I want to I I want to just let you know I send it to all my former students. And uh, it's kept me in touch with them, and and it's kept them in touch with each other because they send it with a big thing, so they all have each other's emails. So, yeah. and I know why I have downloads in Chicago. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but did you, know you tell Pat? Did you tell Pat about the royalties, Steve? Oh, there's no royalties yet. <laughs> they they start in 2065, I believe. The royalty, <laughs> the royalties is the knowledge that I take you away. And the friendship <laughs> that I have with you fellas. That's yeah, royalty. Yeah. And they you are know, royal. That's great. Yeah. And I think that that's the greatest thing, right? I mean, one of the things that I truly enjoy, and we were talking about this prior to, again, um, you guys have started to, you know, Pat gave me new clubs, and I finally can hit a golf ball straight and in like with, with enough uh, authority to not play 17 times on a par three. Um, not bad for lefties, just saying, just exactly. <laughs> I mean, Phil Nick, Phil Nicholson will be calling me any second, huh? mm-hmm. but you know, the royalties that I've had with this great group, and this is something that I constantly think about is that one of the things that Dennis taught me, whether he knows it or not, and this is what you know, we keep on saying about the gifts that give. Dennis is the one who taught me a very, very young, a young time in my career that what I know fits in a thimble. And I got to be open to other ideas. And when I was full of piss and vinegar, when I was like 22, 23, I needed someone who grounded me that way. And I think that that's one of the things that happens too, right? With younger therapists is that, you know, well, I've studied CBT. I know everything about CBT. Well, there's a reason why there's about 17 modalities there, buddy. And I don't know if that's something that you've experienced too. And I'll start with Andy about having that different point of view, just bringing us to the enlightenment for lack of a better word to, I don't know everything. Yeah. It's um, I'm constantly getting brutal reminders of that by life. (laughs) Finding myself in some random dead end that I didn't, that I thought was going to go all the way through, but it was a dead end. But yeah, you know, it's, I, I, I actually have to be careful with getting too directive you know, so trying to keep that listening hat on, trying to keep that hum- humility going and, and not jumping in with my perceived solution to things. Um, I've found that as as I my patience dwindles, which, of course, it does at times, I get more directive and I really need to try to pull pull that back but that's when i hear your guys voices in my head about well you don't really know you don't really know maybe you should ask another question or maybe you should i i learned this from dennis too we all we all have but i learned the, the silence approach works well sit there if you have to wait it out because it doesn't feel it, it feels much longer than it really is just letting that space breathe uh a lot of times the the person's coming up with something in that space i don't think that answered your question but uh we're not here to answer questions we're here to get royalties as i understand (laughs) (laughs) and you got a check for 0.5 cents (laughs) (laughs) i think that's a those are great comments so i um that whole idea of like being patient uh, that's something i've had to learn and uh you know the, 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 Buddhist, <laughs> the Buddha says that the highest form of prayer is patience. Yeah. yeah. And it's, <laughs> I, it's my entire life. That's probably the single biggest thing that Dennis taught me yeah. um, early on was uh, the, the beauty of just silence and being patient. And let, let if you can allow the patient, I think Dennis was the one that said it, but it might have been Dick that said, we, we give everybody two, two titles here. You know, one is a job description and one is their title. And it's, a, it's the same word, patient. When you're in healing mode, you have to be patient. And um, it's, 
You know, it's when we were talking earlier about vulnerability and powerlessness and all of that in our own lives and with our patients. And, um, Andy made it talked about uh, the power of gratitude. It's a grounding thing. It keeps us grounded in the moment. But um, I have a I have a quote that I I think of constantly, a, a, you know, a very a lot, um, from the fabulous Aesop who wrote all the fables. And, and, and he is attributed with saying that um, gratitude is what makes what you have right now enough. And it's, mm. you know, it's, we think about being forward thinking and wanting more of this and more of that, more knowledge and everything. But if I can't be in this present moment, and especially sitting with a, with a client or patient, if I can't say that what I have to offer them is enough right now, um, and if I have a skill set, and sometimes it is just keeping my mouth shut and letting them figure it out. Um, and and what I what I do, I we we bring I bring energy. And and if if there's one thing I miss the most about Zoom telemedicine as opposed to in the office, and I really don't practice in an office anymore, is I miss the energy exchange. I have to work very hard. Um, in this format here. I know you guys so well that it's just, it's there. But um, for someone especially that I don't know as well as I'd like to, um, I'm missing a lot, I think. It takes longer to get a, a sense of them and get kind of an intuitive sense of how I can be of assistance. And sometimes I used to ask that quite quickly as to how do you find that I can help you? It takes a little bit longer before I feel it's, it, they have a sense of that. But mm -hmm. most of it is to just be kind, you know, the old Buddha's loving kindness, just be kind and patient and, and show up and uh, be professional. Kindness goes a long way, though, because when you've been on the other side of health care, you know, a warm blanket in, in an emergency room and some kindness goes a long way. And we mm -hmm. provide that in, in our own ways. And I'll say one last thing. Every student that will hear this knows I've said that. Um, I probably have said it to every class I taught with Andy's students at Boston College as well, is that uh, when you don't know what to do next, just be kind. Um, because you may be meeting someone, uh, you may not know it, but it may be the worst day of their life. And that used to happen in the emergency room a lot. And I'm pretty sure Dennis taught me that. So it could have been Dick again. I can't remember. It was such a rich environment. I can't remember who. As Dick used to say, if you steal from everybody, it, it's just research, not plagiarism. <laughs> That's great. You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Pat. I, the fancy word we use is therapeutic alliance for this kind of stuff. And yet the basis of healing, I'm very convinced after almost 40 years, is 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 the, as Carl Rogers would say, kind of the essence of the, the personality of the therapist to some extent, you know, it's really, it's important that you're kind, that you're patient, that you allow enough space for that person to come forth, you know, that's sitting across from you, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, the gratitude you're talking about is so interesting because uh, that's one of the things that goes against capitalism right now. You know, it's never enough. And I really struggle with you know clients struggle with it and you know you have to decide all right is this something that's uh you know a, as they say a first world problem is it something that's really you know a necessity and uh, you see the, the stark difference between the community mental health system and private practice and it's 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 it's, it's fascinating but it's also uh you got to keep your your self in check because you know, when I get frustrated, sometimes I, I just sit back and I say, what purpose does this behavior or this attitude serve in the person's life? Because they're holding on to it so strongly that it must be something they're awfully uh, afraid to give up. And it's just one of those simple things. But again, you know, the last thing I'll say is that when I talk to my students, I always say, if you're curious, if you remain curious and humble, You'll never get bored in this profession. And, uh, no. the, you know, the, the knowledge base is just expanding ever, you know, so quickly now. It's wonderful. You know, one of the things that I want to throw in a little behavioralism here is that people don't repeat behaviors that didn't pay off. Mm. And even if it didn't pay off the way they wanted, it paid off in somehow. 
And I kind of mm. look and very curious as to what the payoff was for X, Y, Z and what the motivation can be based on that uh, behavior. You know, I, I think I've been I've, I've been a little bit more looking into behavioralism. Maybe it's just the times. But I, I also tell people that people don't learn from behaviors. They learn from consequences. And it's important to remember that, you know, you know, uh, what's his name? Skinner had something in mind when he created that operant conditioning system. And I want to also mention that it was, you know, we, we have a great camaraderie here and I always enjoy that, but you know, it's always nice. I want to note this because it's important. You know, I think all of us have just given lots of flowers to Dennis and I think Dennis they're well-deserved. And I want to make sure that I mention that because this is not something that we do just to give a tribute to Dennis, but we all mean it. And I also think that the sincerity of relationships is also very important when you do peer supervision and stuff like that. So thank you for expressing your gratitude, guys. This, you know, one thing that happens that just I've just been aware of it here is that just revisiting these things keeps it fresh because, you know, I've forgotten most everything. I have to keep relearning. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was you know, one of the great psychiatrists uh, was Dr. John Schott that I got the privilege of working with and listening to and re reading his formulations, reading his notes and that impeccable, long, uh, cursive handwriting. And, um, and I think he was the one that taught us that um, uh, the one question, when you don't know what's going on, ask yourself one last question when you're looking at a patient that you're meeting maybe for the first time or uh, is that is there any unhealthy gain to them steve you're reminding me of that but is there an unhealthy gain or payoff for the patient to retain their symptoms and um that is still one of my default settings is that when i'm, I'm always trying to figure out you know the simplest thing occam's razor what's the simplest thing that explains everything often it's alcohol <laughs> you know, or something like that. But what what could be the any unhealthy pattern that is developed in this person's life for them not wanting to give up this, you know, fear? There's always a fear of change. Was it Joseph Campbell, the, 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 the historian that said that, um, the mythology uh, historian said that the cave you uh, fear to enter holds the treasures that you seek. And um, that's got to be something from Su the Sufis. You know, it's so ancient. But it's the truth is that um, we're supposed to sit with somebody at times and try to help them face their fear because that is the liberation. Um, and sometimes that is meaning to tell the story. They're even afraid to tell the story. Um, and uh, so it's these are the little nuggets that every time I get together with you fellows, they come back to me. And those are the things that sustain my ability to, to be useful, I think, to people. But that's why I value it so. I, I've, been, I've been telling – go ahead, Dennis. I, I was thinking that over the years, and, and Pat, you and I had this side conversation a number of years ago where um, somebody, you, you would come across somebody that you didn't know or remember, and this person was really angry with you. And, and you had no clue why. And uh, I remember having this discussion that over the years, um, and I appreciate the, the, the feedback that folks have given me today, but over the years, there are people that consider me the devil. Because uh, part of, of my job is not only to help people come to face to face with their fears, but to understand what those fears mean and to try and let them go. And letting things go is tremendously difficult and can call up some really significant anger. And, and so that's, uh, I, I think part of the, the uh, um, uh, sort of the underpinning dynamic to, to what we do is helping people to figure out what, what, what do you need to let go of? And it, it sort of links to something that uh, I hadn't thought of it in quite this way, but um, even in people's introduction, recognizing when is it time to stop? When is it time to change? 
um, when is the time to to stop being an attorney? And when is it time to work on being a therapist? When is it time to make a shift to um, uh, midlife, make a decision to become a therapist? Um, we go through these challenges of when is it time to stop throughout our lives? And don't tell me I have to stop because I do not want to stop. <laughs> and I don't like you for telling me that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. our you students you are. Our, our our students are to take it back to the mentorship for a second they're so in fear of that reaction that in, and they're so under pressure internally to be right and that that's just mm. that that's leading them and the client in the wrong direction where that the humility and curiosity is really the the place to to be so that the person can really explore and, and then you don't have to tell them anything exactly. and mm -hmm. and that's where it's important is that you're not telling them anything you're asking them to ask ask mm -hmm. themselves is it time to stop right. mm -hmm. that i've change? seen that a lot the the younger people that i work with the the more severe that issue is for them in in engaging in this work is is that you know they're under so much pressure it's it's life and death i mean the stuff we do is critical but also if you coming in with that kind of pressure preloaded uh, it makes the job a lot harder yeah so trying to get them in check with their own feelings and their own past is is the journey that we've all been on we're still on it but i think it's also built in and I'll give you the example, and I'm going to say this on, this is true, truly part of what happened to me. Um, and it happened to a lot of people I've mentored across uh, throughout the years is that if I'm setting, and you know, I sat with Dennis when I was doing my internship and then started at a community mental health. I sat with Bob at uh, community mental health a few times. One of the things that we go in at school is that you can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. And now I can't look bad in front of Bob or Dennis. They're experienced therapists. They're going to roll their eyes. They're going to look at me. They're going to judge me. They're going to do whatever. And for the record, Dennis and Bob and Pat and Andy have never judged me once. But that's kind of what it brings. A little bit of the education sometimes brings that thought that like you got to be so formulated because they're getting ready for their dissertation or they're getting ready for what have you. If I'm wrong, they're going to call me on it. Well, guess what? We're all wrong most of the time. I coach a bunch of young girls for soccer for the last 10 years. And every month, if not more, when I'm coaching them, I say, look, if I don't make 10 mistakes in a day, I've had a pretty good day. Um, it, that It's just life. And I think that part of what you're talking about, about being a good mentor, being a good supervisor, and even a good teacher is to say, look, you're going to be wrong a whole lot but you're going to probably be right more often than you're wrong. And that's okay because that's what we're here for. That's why we're supporting each other. And that's why it is life or death sometimes, but most of the time it can be fixed because the words, sorry, I was wrong is not that hard for me, mm -hmm. but it was very hard when I was a little young and full of piss and vinegar. And I knew again, I knew everything because I was 24 and I knew absolutely everything. And at 48, I'm like, my God, was I ignorant? And I still am so much more ignorant than I used to be. And I think that humbling experience is so helpful to remember. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it is humbling. It's, um, it, it's so important, I think, uh, that when I look back at uh, what the, some of the seminal things I learned is that to, to the pain that Dennis used to get this when, as a student in doing groups together. He used to get this funny little look that I learned very quickly meant that I was making big mistakes. You get a little curious, and I knew it was going to be a great um, session afterwards. But sometimes when I, what I remember it was it was he that said this, and I'm sure you stole it from somebody, Dennis. We all steal it, but I was glad to have heard it that. Um, You'll, you're not going to learn much from what you know how to do already. You'll only learn a lot from what mistakes you make. Somewhere along the line, and it could have been on my, my other mentor who told me that um, the, the, there's hardly a greater pain that you can experience as an intelligent person to make the same mistakes over and over, which is what a, I'm a recovering 
addict and alcoholic for, for many decades. And, you know, that's part of the forgive self-forgiveness of the 12-step paradigm is to, to forgive yourself for being so breathtakingly imperfect at times. But you can learn a lot from making a mistake only once and learning from it. And that's what I've always tried to encourage people to do, whether they're students or when I used to lecture Andy's class, he's seen this. He used to, I'd, I'd walk around in the circle there and I would not, not let people not be engaged. You know, come on, take a chance. You know, you, you can't be wrong. Trust me, you can't be wrong. And they, they would take a chance. And I'd say, that's a great, of course. And then it'd start something. And you could see the relief, but also the moment of, oh, that's powerful. That moment when they suddenly realized, I have something to offer. And that's when they awakened. And when we've all seen that with patients, when all of a sudden the light comes back, all oh, with students, when, when you take someone in, your, in a position to just be there, when someone starts to come back, when the hope pilot light comes on, if that doesn't get you going, that still keeps me going, is that when you see that, that emanation coming out of people. And you know, these ideas, when people can break the fear paradigm, you know, um, I, was, I, used to, I studied many years ago to become an astrophysicist, really, until advanced calculus uh, threw me in a different trajectory. But um, everything in the universe is energy. It, it matters. You, know, you take a little thing that's an, an atom, you break one of those in half and the city disappears when you release that energy. And sometimes, as Dennis was alluding, the power, you know, um, is that I, I have done that. I have been the, the one that they attributed to being the cause of their misery at that moment. But it was simply, and often later on, they would say, it hurts a lot. I was so overwhelmed by it. But you were right. I know you were right. And sometimes you don't get that. But that's part of what we do. Um, I had to learn, and you fellows taught me a lot, is to, to not be afraid to, to try things. And uh, with, good, with good counsel and, and supervision um, and, and groundedness in, in a kind of a spiritual core, meaning knowing myself and, and liking myself, um, and, then, and knowing there was more to all of this than just this one transaction. Um, I, I felt that I could be helpful, and I've only tried to pass that on. And uh, I also know one last thing I'm, I'm dominating here, forgive me, is that um, I've told every student, because it was told to me, if you're not authentic and taking your own advice, you won't have any credibility. You know, that bumper sticker, take my advice, I'm not using it, doesn't fly at all in healthcare. And um, and so I really, you know, and, and peers like this keep me honest with that. You know, some of the more dark moments when I think I've made mistakes, you know, even in recent years, someone on this panel here would be someone I would talk to and have to be talked off my own ledge of imperfection. I'll just right. put in a plug for a book you all know well, but if someone hasn't read it out there and, and they listen to this podcast, um, it's called, if you're, if you're a recovering person, it's called The Spirituality of Imperfection. And it's coming to peace with the fact that we, the only way you learn is by making mistakes. So we, the only thing we do perfectly is be imperfect. And that's hard for some folks to, to the tyranny of perfectionism in so many ways. So yeah. forgive me, I, I get, I, I go off. Every now. <laughs> I love your stuff, Brad. It's great. Yeah. A <laughs> soliloquy. <laughs> I could listen great. all day. Yeah, 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 me too. I like it. One of, the, one of the truisms that I was taught early on is that the only real mistake we ever make is one we don't recognize. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Boy, I, that's really, you know, I'd like to jump on that because, you know, both, uh, you're all talking about how we have to let go or letting go is so difficult. It is so difficult because there's such a fear of, so if I don't do that, at least one of the fears, you know, and I've learned this both professionally and personally, so what the hell am I supposed to do if I let that go? You know, that's that's been a go-to. You know, booze is like this. You know, like, uh, hey, what's what's my answer to this? Yeah, I think I'll take a drink or five. You know, I mean, I and there's a there's a lot of that that I see in my family, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out: do we need to replace the 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 unhealthy habit with with healthier coping skills? And for some people, I think we do. 
need to help them learn not only that let it this is destructive this one's destructive on this side but can we actually provide some hope that there's some different way of doing things that um can can be useful for them and get them to a different place that's going to be much less painful and you know much more fulfilling and you know an example of this is something that uh I'm smiling because I have a very interesting family and I've learned a lot of things. One of the things I learned was anticipate the negative. And uh, it's, it's such an interesting thing because if, if I was raised Catholic and one of the things is, don't worry, don't get too happy. You know, things are going to go bad. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to suffer at some point soon. And I, and I, and I think uh, it's such an interesting thing because depending on your family, especially if you grow up in a dysfunctional family, what you learn is to be scanning, I call it. And you scan for the negative to happen. And if you do that, guess what? You're going to find some. And the pro- so the, the problem is, though, it takes you out of the moment. I think, Pat, you were talking about this. It takes you out of the moment. And it's so nice when you can just let go and be. And if something happens, then you can deal with it. But to let go of that anticipatory kind of uh, urgency or or the anxiety it's it's fascinating how much room that takes up and how much energy it takes up and letting it go is so it's relieving but you got to keep on working it Mm -hmm. yeah you're letting go we see a lot now and i know some of you are advocates as well of the manifestation you know um philosophy that you know what if you're absorbed in something you can manifest it You, you know if you're giving off positive energy you will attract positive energy. The Mayo Mentor Dick told me this, you know, he said, uh, I was going to be in a conference in, in, in the city. And he said, okay. He said, you, you want to test this? He said, for three city blocks at noontime, when you go out for your break, um, for one block, go scowl at people, you know, just look menacing. The next block, give them the thousand mile neutral stare. And for the next block, smile at everybody, nod, say hello. See what you get back. It's stunning. Mm. We get back, and so uh, I've taken a lot of time to to not focus on on outcomes that I don't want. Focus on the outcomes that I do want, and that's you know the manifestation business. That is putting out energy that then attracts the same energy. You know, I, if I had a guy. Is- I had a guy um, just the other day say to me, uh, a, a patient talking about anxiety. And he said, I can't let go of my anxiety because my anxiety is always right. In other words, what he and what he meant by that is everything I'm worried about always happens because I'm smart and I'm thinking ahead and I can see what's coming. And it, it, I didn't have a response right away to that because I had never heard it put that way before. But it's what you're talking about, Pat, about manifesting. It's about, you know, what are you putting out there that's also coming back your way? But he's viewing it as he's excluded himself from the equation and it's all just stuff that's happening to him. And he doesn't want to let go because it's his predictive mechanism. He's actually, to your point, Steve, about what is he, what's the payoff? He gets knowledge of the future out of it. He gets actual predictability out of it which is i mean, makes some weird sense but it, it was just fascinating to hear it that way i'd never heard it like that before well, self-fulfilling prophecy is what that is yeah and has, the- has anyone ever made a 18 inch putt that you knew as you stood over it you weren't going to make it <laughs> <laughs> not yesterday <laughs> right, I think it, yeah i think that's what it is i was going to say like okay so when we play golf it's going to go straight. It's going to go left. It's going to go right. Or it's going to hit the water or the sand. Here we go. I predicted what's going to happen. Yeah. Cause you made five predictions. So of course one of them happens to be right. And you're going to omit the four that were wrong. You're going to say, see, that one was right. I knew it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I talk about. What I tell my clients, I, I've had a few anxious clients who didn't put it exactly that way, but I said, well, if you make 15 predictions, there's a likelihood that one of them will be right. And you'll omit what was wrong in order to say, look, I can predict the future. So that's how I challenge that personally. But I wanted to get jump to something else because one of the things we kind of like all alluded to 
is that as therapists, we're not perfect. And what I also think is important to realize is that I was sitting here prior to the interview, even before you came on, I'm like, all five of us have stuff going on that are not related to therapy that are outside of us and that's our private lives. And, you know, Pat started off by saying, oh, if I'm distracted, something's going on in my life. I'm not here to put anyone out. So I'm not saying what that is. If he wants to share, that's up to him. But I think that we were all talking about that. And I think it's important, like, you know, when I say finding your way through therapy in this podcast, I keep in mind that we need to also lift the veil that therapists are human. And that sometimes for me, like, you know, I right now I'm good. I like, uh, you know, but there's times where I'm like sitting with a client or sitting with my peers and I'm already thinking about, all right, well, oh, this is going to happen or what have you. I'm probably looking at surgery in the next few weeks myself. And so sometimes like, oh, how am I going to manage this? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in my head. I'm no longer doing two things at once. It's not possible because I'm not paying attention to the person in front of me, whether it's therapy, whether it's a peer or whether it's just my kids or my life in general. And I think I want to humanize that in a little bit and talk about about our powerlessness as therapists sometimes, too. The knowledge of who I am isn't up here. It's in it's in the heart. You know, there's been so much study and, and talk about the, the heart as an organ, but it's also a part of our centeredness and in, in what we are. It's it's what makes us smile at little little babies and kittens and all of the things that people find heartwarming, literally. And I think I've learned over the years, I've more recently I've been focusing on trying to get people out of the head, which is where anxiety and fear lives. Forgive me, I'll be indelicate. My term for it is the itty bitty shitty committee that keeps rattling around, and it's a it's a stress engine. And to and to get people out of that, there's an ingenious thing that uh, um, forget who came up with it. Uh, it'll come to me, but um, oh, it was um, Eckhart Tolle. Tolle, uh, yeah, this, I think he's Swiss, but it's a, a quick breathing technique, and 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 then you you. You basically think about, um, you know, uh, 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 evaporate the last thought and then wait for the next thought to come in your mind. It, nothing comes because you've, you've changed it out of the head and into the body and into the heart. It's an ingenious way. And, 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 uh, but it's, it's just getting out of, um, uh, of that perseverating thought. So we hear about all of the time where we're, um, I forget it must have been a, a Buddhist or a Sufi quote that um, worrying about um, tomorrow or what's in the future doesn't change it. It just changes today for the worse. It takes peace of mind out of today. You know, so um, I, I, these are the techniques and my techniques have to do with breath work and and the energy work and things like that that can get people kind of oriented to, to thinking more, uh, being more in their heart and letting that direct action as opposed to the head. But there is, if you're, for people that are really smart, sometimes that's an illusion of control is that I know what's going to happen next. There's no point to me saying that because I know what they're going to say. And really, there also is a dynamic of control of ourselves and that, um, I do believe very firmly that um, when we're sitting in therapy and one of the core elements to professionalism as a therapist and a, a, a capacity that allows people to stay in, as therapists is that when you're distracted like that, when you're feeling at your worst, it's, it's when you can sort of buckle down and focus the most and stay with the patient stay with the client. Um, if you can't do that, you won't last. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I believe is just, it's an absolute requirement. And that's about self-control. It's about recognizing what, what not only can I do, but what I need to do. Um, if, if I'm going to be able to su successfully stay in this kind of practice for any length of time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that 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 is um i think that's also one of the core elements of burnout over time is that we we do have to put that energy in it's interesting dennis i think that whole self control you know the ability to to kind of align yourself with what is in front of you you know what is the goal what is my task 
what's happening right now and um, what I talk to a lot of students about and what I've experienced over the years is that you are living your life outside of the therapy room and um, things happen a lot. And for example, say you have a relationship and there's there's tension and conflict in that relationship. You're walking into your therapy office trying to figure out, all right, I'm going to I'm going to center myself. I'm going to calm myself. and I'm going to put that off to the side. You know, we have the fancy name of compartmentalization, but that's not an easy thing to do, especially if you get triggered by someone who's talking about the fact that they're struggling with their wife or husband or partner. And so I, I, I agree with you with a hundred percent. And it is a discipline that over time you learn, but it does take a lot of energy at times. You um, compartmentalizing is, I I agree, 100% required for the job. But at the same time, trying to be a human being in the room requires for me, and I'll myself here, and I I know that Not everybody agrees with this dogmatically, but requires to some degree a sharing of yourself, you know, uh, that in order. So often I I'll weave in a story or I will share something about what's going on in my life. Um, And I I find nearly 100 percent of the time we we, I know which clients can take it, which ones can't. Let's just put it that way. But the ones who can and who they actually crave it, they actually want to know more about you. And then that's that presents a whole nother roster of issues about what's appropriate and what isn't. But I find that that tends to be connective tissue for the relationship because it's a relationship and we can't it can't just be in my estimation one way, which is how I think we wanted to do it. 50 years ago, (laughs) it wanted it to be on the couch in one way and don't ever look at me and don't ask me any questions. But if we want to be humans and we want to work with other humans and have real relationships, it's got to be more two way. And uh, so I, I try to invite that, but it requires quite a bit of finesse to not go over, to not, um, you know, be triggering yourself by interposing your own set of feelings and circumstances, but um, you do learn, you do learn how to get better at it. Yeah. And that's where staying focused on that skill, regardless of what's going on outside, finding that balance. That's where that's critical. And and yeah, Andy, it's a wonderful point. And I think that people can tell if you're being authentic and the authenticity, I think, builds the relationship and sharing at times, it strengthens the therapeutic alliance, the bond, whatever you want to call it that happens in this room, the energy between you. But again, like you said, it's, it, you, it requires discretion and discernment. And it's really a matter of trying to figure out what can this person, what, what would benefit this person? I will share if this is going to be helpful for that person. And if not, then don't. But uh, it is an interesting question. But I, I agree 100%. And sometimes it's, it's at a moment where the, the patient needs to, to learn or to, to be reinforced that you, you are just as imperfect as they are. You just have a certain set of skills they don't have. They have their own skills. Um, and there are those moments. I learned it from a student, actually. My first, very first student. I came in. I was working till 11 o'clock at night, and I was in the hospital at 7 the next morning. I was a bit of an overworker in those days. <laughs> And um, but she she looked at me at 7 a.m. and she was heading over to the ER and said, uh, you look really tired. And I, I get defensive, like I'm not supposed to be tired and everything. And then I finally did it. No, you're absolutely right. I'm exhausted. <laughs> and so I'm going to let you go over and uh, and so you come back and, and you know, if you need some help with this or something. And that was a moment I realized is that uh, uh, it was my first student and I was in a more of uh, trying to orient myself uh, to my persona as a uh, as teacher or mentor. And I've learned that with my patients as well. There are times they just need to know because some, some have asked me, I mean, do you ever have problems? And I go, oh, my God, yeah, but my job is to not have you take care of me. And you're very good at taking care of other people. So, oh, yeah. It's, and pointing out to them that 
this is not new. It feels very unique to you because you've never experienced it, but this is all too common. You know, the hardest thing to do as a human being is something unique. You know, with 7 billion of us on the planet at this moment in time, everyone goes through a lot of their own stuff. Everyone has to deal with things. And um, and we, I don't know if compartmentalize is a word I would have used, but I know when I need to leave it on the other side of the door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, which is, as I've said, practicing at home is harder you know, in a home office situation because everything is just on the other side of the door. It's not 20 miles away or whatever. And um, which is why sound machines work just as well in a home office as they do everywhere else. It's just to keep a barrier, like a white noise barrier on the other side of it. But uh, I I had to learn to become, and I was taught to become human in, in a way. And if, if I'm operating with motivated by just trying to be helpful and uh, and utilizing the skills that I've been taught, um, my boundaries are good, I probably can't make a mistake with a little bit of kind of generic self-disclosure. It's like when you, you decide with a male or female, you're going to wear a wedding ring. That's information. You know, we used to think you couldn't share anything. You know, um, that's that's not the way it's, I don't think the way it's done now. And especially with Google and other things, people can find out all kinds of stuff, you know, about you. So, so what, one of the things I was taught is that you can pretty much share anything as long as you are ready to deal with the reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a great comment, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. Right. From the but same think- source, that's right. But I think it's also, you know, you talked about different types of things that we believe in. I believe in the law of attraction in the sense that you'll attract the right people who will be able to take that information. And it's also the discernation, the, the I can't find, find the word I'm saying it in French, uh, but being able to tell that, you know, with Dennis today talking about my own stuff is not a good idea, but Pat is okay. And uh, Bob is, I don't know, we'll see if I just like put a feeler out there. And we we get that clinical experience, but we can't have, you know, going back to a little bit of what we talked about earlier, we can't have those feelers without knowledge and being able to make those mistakes. I'm trying to put a little bow on it because I'm looking at the time. We already filled an hour. Um, And because we're not busy at all, we all have places to go and things to do. So again, you know, I had what another seven questions. We got to two per usual. <laughs> um, so you know, guys, you know the new season's going to be starting in January. This, uh, you know, this is October, but in January, and I'm obviously going to reinvite all of you, and I want to be respectful of your time. So I want to say again, thank you. I should be on the golf links uh, in two weeks. Hopefully, we can still play. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But again, thank you for coming to Finding Your Way Through Therapy and hope you enjoyed your experience. Well, this concludes episode 122, Dennis Sweeney, Pat Rice, Dr. Robert Cherney, and Andrew Kang. Thank you so much. Um, We're going to have this again. We can never get through all the questions, but that's just par for the course for the guys that we are. But episode 123 will be with a comedian, And I'm looking forward to meeting him on a podcast because Brad Mastrangelo is someone that I've known because I worked with his wife for a long time. So I hope you join me for that next interview. Please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States.